Um, without further ado, then, um, I'm just not going to do again, I'm not going to read the biography, but uh, John Sachs, a very well known person in, in our industry, one of the founders of Highwire, and he's going to talk to us about data science and artificial intelligence. John. Thanks. I, I, there's, from up here, I can see that it's a lot more crowded toward the back of the room than the front of the room. So I don't know if that's like church where nobody sits in the front pews or something. All right. Uh, so I'm going to uh, begin with an introduction, uh, uh, then use some uh, use cases uh, and examples in scholarly work, uh, and finally uh, close with some cautions about uh, what I see as the road ahead. <clears throat> Never speak after lunch. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to do um, a, a sweeping AI overview. I'm only going to offer uh, brief comments uh, about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, nothing about robots or autonomous cars. I'm not going to talk about how artificial intelligence and machine learning work. Uh, but I really want to look at the applications that I see as being first or second cousins uh, of what we do in scholarly publishing. So I think we're already seeing where AI might be making inroads uh, in consumer publishing. Uh, this story, I hope you can at least read the headlines. Uh, this story is actually from three years ago, uh, demonstrating that financial reporting could essentially be routinized. In this application, artificial intelligence is turning facts uh, that are in a financial reporting database into a narrative. Uh, it, the, the AI is not doing any analysis uh, or understanding of what's going on in the financial report. It's essentially pulling facts out uh, and turning it into the same kind of narrative that analysts used to write in the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times. AI is also finding its way into areas we normally think of as creative arts, uh, such as making music. Uh, and the, if you go to this story uh, online, you can actually listen to some of the, the music that's been composed, and you'd say, yes, this is actually a real composition, perhaps at the level of a beginning music composition student. But there do seem to be some limits uh, ahead uh, for AI in some of the creative industries. Uh, Essentially, the same AI that was doing the music was uh, uh, trained to tell jokes, and it failed. Uh, so comedy seems to be a higher bar than most AIs can handle. Now, that, that itself is a humorous point, perhaps, uh, but I actually think it's an important one. Uh, comedy is sort of made up of, of edge cases. It's a place where uh, things collide that we find interesting and humorous. Uh, and I, I'd say that... Uh, perhaps editors uh, sussing out novel or clever science are actually doing something very similar, where they're, they're figuring out that these things fit together in an unusual and interesting way. So I think that's a, a cautionary uh, point for AI until it can handle comedy. Now, more important, I suspect, than how AI will help publishing science is how it will help augment the experts themselves who are doing the science. Uh, this type may be too small for the, all of you in the back of the room to read, uh, but it essentially says that 44% of life science professionals uh, are using or experimenting with AI now. And within two years, they expect to be, 94%. That's a huge number. Uh, and that is, of course, going to affect uh, the communications that we work with. So the previous slide was about scientists working on individual research projects. Let's now think instead about, say, journal editors who assemble a portfolio of papers into a journal. And the question is, is a journal of papers much like a portfolio of stocks? Someone's making a selection and essentially putting them together into a mix that works well. And I can imagine an AI someday managing the journal equ equivalent of an index fund which I would say is, it, is the mega journal that we heard about earlier today, or a preprint server. Uh, but, but right now I see that there's a, a novelty selection function that most editors are performing, they, the, the principle of uh, selectivity in their journals, that probably is going to be a real challenge for artificial intelligence. 
So now I want to start taking a bit of a tour through some of what's going on right now. Everything I show you here uh, is real. Some of it is prototype and not operating at scale, though. Some of it is, pr is in production, and some of it is in beta. So I'm going to start uh, by looking at AI use by readers and authors. I'm breaking it down into these three areas, uh, keeping up, writing up, and dreaming up. Uh, so let me start with keeping up. And here we see alerts on new articles. There are many examples of this. Uh, and most of them are relying on natural language processing to extract key concepts. NLP, as it's usually called, is, is a, a strong part of artificial intelligence. It's one of the parts that's been zooming ahead, uh, along with machine vision and, and other kinds of concepts. It's able to extract the key concepts and match them to your interests. A company called Meta, for example, was recently purchased by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, uh, and it's soon to have its uh, service released for free. Uh, use and its main use case is helping people who are deeply embedded in their lab research keep up with what's going on so that they don't have to be scanning journals uh, to stay in touch. Some of these keeping up tools are really clever in figuring out your what you're interested in based on what you're writing about. And then it, gives me, it uh, sends me alerts uh, based on my publishing history. Uh, and I have found those alerts to be remarkably on point. Uh, the top two are always things I want to read. Uh, the rest of the, the next 10 might not be so much, but the top ones really are. There are also now uh, recommendation services that go well beyond the generic tables of contents and keyword-based alerting that we've had for 20 years. Uh, these. Uh, uh, some of my favorites are in uh, Google Scholar, uh, Meta, and Springer all do these kinds of alerts. Now let's take a look uh, at a few of these, uh, just a, uh, screenshot examples. This one, I don't know if you can read the, the, the name of this uh, uh, tool. It's called the Archive Sanity Preserver. I like it just because of the name. It was developed by a researcher, just as many of these tools are, and the researcher was trying to keep up with the volume of publishing work uh, in, of, in his field in archive, which is obviously a very high volume preprint server. I think this is important also because we should expect to see tools like this proliferate uh, as there's more, uh, more open content, such as in preprint servers. Uh, and as there are more identifiers uh, that become common, like ORCID, uh, to help connect things up. So I think we'll see tools uh, in artificial intelligence developed uh, by individuals. And the question is, how much can we rely on those tools, not individuals? Uh, this tool uh, was created by Unsilo for Nature. Uh, and it has a feature that I find particularly interesting for keeping up. It helps me find things that are related to my interests but buried inside an article, possibly not even mentioned in the article title or abstract. Uh, and for a lot of people, uh, you might be interested in a small piece of an article, a method or a reaction or something like that, uh, but you want to apply it in a different domain. So you're not even reading that particular journal. You may not even have heard about the journal uh,
newly submitted articles to their journal suite. Uh, so it's typically used by publishers who have five to 50 journals uh, and want to be able to see if a person who submitted a journal, uh, an article to journal A uh, really should have gone to journals C, D, and E. Uh, and this software uh, lets that happen. Uh, you could imagine this is uh, easily being offered to authors to identify well-matched journals for their paper even before they submit it somewhere else. But you could also imagine that predatory journals would want to buy their way onto this list and influence the algorithm. And I think that's uh, a caution. Now, after writing up, uh, I, I chose this concept, concept I called dreaming up, basically getting a start uh, on productive, prospective research directions. How do you figure out what you should study? Uh, and this. Uh, piece here is from 2007. It's research that was done at Stanford, uh, and a number of high-wire part publishers participated in it. Uh, and what the uh, researcher uh, in computer science was doing was writing software that would decompose an article into the assertions it makes, the assertions about the, wor the natural world, and then construct a truth table made up of those assertions. And it was important that the assertions had directional relationships between the entities. So this was not just breaking it up into concepts or keywords or lists of genes or proteins. So it was gene A translates protein B. That would be the kind of, of relationship he would uh, identify. Uh, and then you could imagine uh, with these truth tables that you could uh, put search engine software on top of it uh, and also logic manipulating software that could essentially do the kinds of things that logic students uh, are trained to do. And in fact, this prototype uh, from EMBO that I'm showing here indirectly follows on that 2007 research. Uh, it's now a prototype at EMBO called Source Data. And what EMBO is doing here is decoding figures and legends into the assertions uh, and then putting them into a search engine that's on top of that. But that search engine is directionally aware. I'll read you the, the circled part here. It says, try these searches. Does insulin influence glucose? Or does glucose influence insulin? Those two searches will get entirely different results in this tool. Whereas in most search engines, they'll get you about the same list. Now I'm going to go on from uh, talking about AI for readers and authors to AI for editors and publishers. At Highwire, we could imagine what editors wanted from AI, but we didn't really know since we don't edit journals there. So we asked the editors. Uh, in late January, we organized a workshop uh, with our partners Meta and Google, plus 15 editors and 15 publishers, and worked for two days uh, on this topic. So here's what we heard from one of the editors about what she really wanted to have happen with AI software. And what she was telling us was that she wanted essentially for the AI to bring evidence to the table so that instead of having long religious debates about topics, they'd actually have some data, uh, essentially trying to introduce evidence-based thinking into uh, uh, editorial practice. But we did get a little more advice than this from them. Uh, and this is what I summarize uh, the two days of meetings uh, as telling us broken it out into four key areas. First, editors wanted to understand how their journals were performing. First, relative to the goals that they were setting, particularly for subject coverage, but also relative to other journals that were in the same subject market. Uh, second, under community engagement, they wanted to be more effective uh, in the very labor-intensive and somewhat serendipitous uh, practice of attending meetings. In other words, they wanted to know which meetings to go to and who to talk to at those meetings and what to talk to them about. Uh, and they felt that AI could help them with that. Uh, next, they wanted to be able to see new fields emerging uh, for obvious reasons, but uh, to be able to recruit authors, editors, uh, and uh, review writers, and reviewers and review writers. And then finally, and probably the area where much of it will start, uh, is for efficiency. Uh, they wanted to spend less uh, author, editor, and reviewer time on submission mechanics, checklist validation, statistical reviews, image integrity evaluation, and so on. And we'll look at prototypes behind some of these. So this first is uh, uh, 
one example of uh, looking at journal performance. I'll show some others in, uh, a bit uh, further on. Here, uh, with a tool from Meta, uh, that's uh, a dashboard now in beta with uh, eight of Highwire's publishers and I believe with a number of others. Uh, journal performance is looked at more in real time, uh, showing a three-month rolling window rather than the years-long lag uh, that you get uh, by looking at impact factors. This software looks at patterns in recently published articles uh, to see uh, what articles are predicted to have leading impact, uh, which uh, what the aggregate of the most recent three months articles look like in, in subject terms. So it helps you recognize uh, superstar papers uh, and helps you evaluate whether you're shifting a subject balance in a way that you'd like. Uh, Meta also has a, a tool that helps uh, editors uh, assess individually submitted articles while they're still under review. It allows publishers to rank manuscripts uh, based on predictive profiling. Uh, it allows them also to, to do the cascade evaluation that I uh, showed you a picture of earlier uh, to see if there are sister journals that might be more appropriate within the portfolio. Uh, it also has the ability to suggest reviewers based on analysis of similar papers. As a profiling system, it's important to note that this system does not evaluate the quality of the science or the conclusions of the manuscripts. I haven't seen anything uh, that's going in that direction yet. Here we have uh, editors using artificial intelligence much as readers uh, would use an alerting system, except that it's alerting editors for manuscripts that, that match the editor's journal's profile of topics. In other words, essentially they're going fishing in archive or bioarchive to find the papers that match their journal's profile or that match a prospective profile where they've said, we want to get more papers in X, we have to be more assertive in attracting those papers. Uh, so they can then follow up uh, on match by contacting the authors to s uh, solicit a preprint as a paper. And there are uh, definitely quite a few journals that are already doing this, but they're all doing it manually. I don't know anybody who has, has set up any kind of AI tools for this yet. Uh, I mentioned uh, that a key, one of the four key areas people wanted help with was uh, identifying emerging concepts. Uh, and Meta has a tool now, it's not yet available uh, to public, uh, where they're peering essentially over the horizon. I know this is really hard to see, but uh, there are, each line is a, is a concept, uh, and a journal can nominate certain concepts that they want to be tracking and see whether they're starting to pop. Or, in a way, you're also interested in those that are declining. Uh, in terms of, of productivity, I think one of the places we see experts needing to be involved uh, over and over again is doing subject categorization uh, of articles in a journal, perhaps to create curated lists. Uh, Unsilo has uh, a tool to do this now, uh, and its user interface is incredibly fine. Uh, it's the best one I've seen uh, in any of the tools I've looked at. Uh, it essentially populates articles into subject categories, and it uh, on the left are things that it's, it's said definitely are not in this subject category. On the right, it says here are things that definitely are in this subject category. And then there's a middle ground where you can evaluate the articles and put them in or out. And depending on what you tell it, the software improves its, its ability to, uh, to know what's up. Another uh, part uh, where we see enormous amounts of, of time and money at certain journals going into uh, editorial integrity is image evaluation. Uh, and it looks like there is promise uh, that uh, this kind of expertise and in, uh, intensive task could be automated. Uh, this is a, this article, this paper, uh, showing a method to detect one aspect of figure integrity problems was just posted in BioArchive last week. Now I'd like to bounce back to talking about readers and authors' interests, but now look at it from a data science perspective. Data science uh, is, is probably already highly used uh, to uh, suggest to authors where they should submit uh, articles. Here I'm showing uh, a Google Scholar metrics page for a particular journal. Prospective authors essentially can look at the top articles in a journal, 
ranked by H, the H5 score and see if, that, if those articles match the types of articles that they write. Essentially, is this, is this a club you'd want to join? Uh, at the bottom, uh, data science already helps readers choose which articles to read based on metrics, as shown here uh, in PLOS. Uh, you can see the metrics are off on the bottom right. It's pretty standard, and, and I think PLOS does a beautiful job of highlighting uh, those metrics. Now, uh, finish with looking at uh, data science in service to editors and publishers. I'm going to try not to be too self-promotional here. Uh, Highwire has a product in this area. Uh, and it, it's called Impact Visor. It's a tool, essentially, to investigate journal performance. Uh, and we've built it to be able to look at uh, what happens to articles that a journal rejects, uh, what's the impact of the articles you accept, but what's the impact now? Uh, in other words, not waiting six months, 12 months, 18, or 36 months. Uh, and then what's changing in your field? And we do this uh, through uh, seven viewers. I'm just showing six of them here. The point is that it, it has to be a graphical tool. Editors told us that they didn't want to slog through long tables of, of art, lists of articles that were high impact or what. They wanted to see visually uh, the, the trends. Uh, we also found that we had to be able to incorporate unique metadata to make this analysis essentially personalized to a journal. Uh, the, the metadata has to come from the journal's own publishing system. What do you call that type of article in your journal? Not what does Clarivate call it uh, or what does uh, Scopus call it. I'm just going to uh, give you two uh, uh, use case examples here. Um, uh, this is uh, a visualization of uh, performance of sections in a journal. And here uh, we had a publisher who was uh, concerned because they saw their impact dropping year on year in their flagship journal. Only about 10%, but they wanted to know what to make of it. And uh, what they could see with this uh, visualization was that there was a certain category of articles that were always under the bar. That vertical yellow bar is the journal's average impact metric in that particular year. And this collection of articles uh, was consistently under the bar, and they were publishing a lot of them. They were case studies, uh, case reports. And what uh, the editors of the journal decided to do is to pull those out of their flagship journal, but because they were popular, they decided they would create an OA journal uh, devoted to this topic, uh, which is of, of great interest to their membership. I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this one, but this is a marketing use uh, of uh, the same tool, essentially pulling data uh, out of the tool to, to communicate to authors how rapidly the articles that they publish are cited in this particular journal. This is uh, another type of uh, metric that, another type of analysis uh, that we found was of great interest uh, to publishers. This is a particular one that we worked with, uh, a way of visualizing a journal's market share. Uh, the journal we were working uh, for is in the blue band in the center. And you can see that, that that's green, blue green, I guess. Uh, it's, you can see that it's shrinking over time, starting in about 2005. They saw their submissions decline about then, and their assessment was that it was due to PLOS One. But the PLOS One growth spurt was up in 2010. You can see the, the gold at the top is several years later. So the, the answer was not, oh, it's PLOS One, wring your hands. There are other things you could do about it. Uh, similarly, uh, another a similar visualization, but showing a very different thing, is essentially showing the ebb and flow of the topics that that particular journal was publishing in. Uh, and you could see that some topics were shrinking, sh some were expanding, and they could then decide, okay, how do we want to reposition the journal? Uh, there also is uh, data science, uh, data analytics that can be used to design our journal sites. The example on the bottom left is called a confetti or a click map, and it's essentially a heat map showing where people are clicking on a page. Now, if you have a lot of stuff on your page that's not getting clicked on, it's just visual clutter. And this helped us to simplify uh, sites as the publishers called for redesigns. Uh, and now, just for some cautions in closing, there is a lot of hype about uh, 
artificial intelligence and machine learning right now. The arrow uh, is pointing to where machine learning shows up uh, in this. It's, it's just past the peak of inflated expectations, which doesn't sound like a good place to be, does it? Uh, so we're definitely in the hype zone uh, for this. Uh, but interestingly, Gartner uh, not only predicts where something is in this curve, uh, but they predict how long it will be before you get really productive use out of it. And it's, it's actually pretty soon, two to five years uh, for this. Uh, we tend, as an industry, uh, to overstate the potential of the things. It's, it's like everybody gets really enthusiastic about a new technology, especially if you're a company founder who's got to sell the idea to venture capitalists. You expect that it will suddenly take over the world. Uh, and we, we tend, though, at the same time to understate the consequences in the long term. And I think uh, we have examples of social media and its influence uh, on elections uh, in, the, in the United States right now. Uh, it's important, I think, for us to understand that AI, machine learning, is part of this, this cycle. And I'd like to close just with a, a pitch or a plea uh, that one sign of the hype cycle uh, is that there are not only inflated expectations, but inflated and unverified claims. And my recommendation to all of us uh, uh, whether we are building the technology or whether we're, we're consuming it or considering it, uh, is that we proceed as if there were, this were research. If there's a claim, there has to be evidence to back it up. Uh, and as a matter of appropriate practice, we figure out ways to validate our models uh, that are using AI and machine learning. Uh, so this, what's showing here is an example of some work we did with Meta uh, last fall. Essentially, they have some software that predicts citations out three years. So what we did is essentially rewind uh, in our impact visor tool and look and compare Meta's prediction of three-year citations to articles that were published three years ago. And we could uh, use R squared and p-values to say this is about how good this is. Now, we have to find appropriate validation methods for all this stuff. Uh, like if it's going to generate a list of reviewers for you, is that a good list of reviewers or is it just the, the usual biased set of suspects? Uh, how to do that is, is part of what we all get to figure out. Uh, but I'd like to suggest that anything we decide is, that's worth implementing is also worth validating. Thank you. Oh, questions? Questions? Yeah, you Two minutes for questions. I'll be at the breaks and stuff. Always appreciate questions. Anthony, I knew I could count on you down in the front pew there. Uh, I, if you shout it to me, I'll repeat it. I'm doing it for you, John, because oh. I know you like questions. Um, if you were a person who had to do something serious to your, say, your journal workflow, you knew all sorts of things were buzzing around, you had no idea, what would the, your lesson be in one, two sentences? One, what, would, what principles would you decide on which technologies you should adopt? And secondly, what principles should you use to decide what you should certainly not adopt? Okay, let me think about this. Ah, I have the answer to that written on page three. Um, <laughs> I think uh, my belief is that the, the innovations uh, are going to come in pieces. They're going to come in these, you know, these, these four areas. You know, productivity was one, journal performance was another, and so on. And that we need to be able to plug them in uh, and experiment with them uh, and validate them. Uh, and so I would look in principle for partners uh, who are good at plugging things in. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily look for people who are building this stuff themselves because uh, they could be high risk. Uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a one person, uh, you know, a CS grad student, uh, that person could be, you know, uh, out on a, a faculty appointment in a year and leave the software behind. Uh, but I think those of us, uh, some of us are good at partnering, uh, and that's an important part of the, uh, the process. Uh, because 
frankly, the area is moving so fast, uh, it would be hard to invest. If you, your company is not an AI company, it might be hard to invest in it, uh, to recruit the staff and, and so on. So those would be my principles, Anthony, is modularity and, and not build it yourself. All right. Thanks. Oh, one more? Do we have time for one more? One more? Hi, this is Tiberius Igna from SKS. Do you see, and if you see, can you elaborate a bit on a dividing, possible dividing line between programming artificial intelligence and training artificial intelligence? Oh, very good, uh, good example, good question. Um, I hadn't thought of that distinction. Uh, I, uh, my sense is there's definitely a distinction. Um, if you look at the, the unsilo uh, uh, example that I put up, the second one, um, where it was figuring out what subject categories things go into, uh, that's software that needs training. Uh, I think it, it takes some editorial smarts uh, and probably some legacy knowledge of your literature to know where to pull the training set so that you don't get too biased a training set. And I don't think that's a technology expertise, that's, a, that's editorial understanding. Uh, so I think training in machine learning is, is a, a, a separate skill. Let's see, what's that? There's a name for it. Uh, it's something like target development. Oh, uh, feature selection. It's called feature selection. Uh, and I think uh, that can be uh, uh, taught. Um, and it's not the same as developing uh, AI algorithms. There's also a difference between the people who are developing new algorithms and, of course, the people who are essentially data scientists who are putting the algorithms to work in a particular application. Uh, Google and, and others are working to make that, that ladder, the, the people who are putting it to work, a, a sort of a workbench kind of thing where you don't really need deep computer science knowledge to, to do that. Uh, they're doing it especially in vision, training systems to uh, recognize objects. Thanks. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you very much, John. Thank you.